Well, hello and welcome everyone to this talk. People are still coming in, but I think um, it's at the hour. So let's get started. I hope that you can hear me. Um, this is our second keynote of the day uh, here uh, virtually in Paris at the American University. And it's my pleasure and honor to introduce to you Molly Andrews, our second keynote speaker. Um, Molly Andrews is professor of political psychology and also the coordinator of the Center of Narrative Research at the University of East London. She's currently though a visiting professor at the Helsin Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies at uh, the University of Helsinki. Uh, Molly is the author of several papers and books one among them, uh, which I mean, they're all very much recommended for reading, but I recommend this one in particular is Shaping History Narratives of Political Change, uh, which also received the Outstanding Book Award of the American Education Research Association. Um, and uh, yeah, so I know Molly for a long time. I've been uh, one of her students. And so I'm very excited to have her here at our conference and I would like to give her the floor. Molly, if you want to come on. Okay. There you are. So, hello everyone. And um, well, thank you very much, Martin, for inviting me and introducing me. And, um, and I really look forward to this discussion. I want to uh, say to the audience that, um, in fact, I had originally um, pre-recorded this talk, but then I realized that I really, really need to know there is actually an audience there live. So um, I need my audience. So, um, so I'm, I'm going to just be speaking to these slides and um, I look forward to our discussion uh, afterwards. So let's start then. Okay. Okay, so um, the title of my talk, as you can see, is the COVID-19 pandemic and the failure of narrative imagination. I'm gonna take off these um, headphones for a moment, just. Okay, so hopefully that is okay. Um, the talk that I'm going to give actually is based on some is based on a framework that I laid out in my book, Narrative Imagination and Everyday Life. And I'm going to be looking at how that framework, which I set out there, relates to our current moment of crisis. So, what is wrong there? Okay. Um, so in this book, Narrative Imagination and Everyday Life, I argued that bringing narrative and imagination together actually brings three aspects um, of analysis really into focus. And the first is the dynamic nature of the temporal. The second is the mediation between the real, the not real, and what Sartre calls the not yet real. And the third is the complexity of the construction of the other. And I'm going to be talking about each of these in turn in relation to the crisis. Okay, so the first is the dynamic nature of the temporal or what I call time traveling. Well, this points us to the fluidity of time, how in fact, um, we don't really live by clock time, we, we live by visiting and revisiting past moments in light of the present. We rethink the future in light of things which are currently happening or not happening. And um, so we revisit the past in light of what we currently know. We reimagine our present lives. Um, and we, in fact, then look to create new futures. Sometimes, I mean, we tend to create hope, but also very much feared futures. So let's look at how those map out in the current moment. First, the question of revisiting the past. 
Well, here, there's been a lot of re reimagining the present um, in terms of what if we had known something earlier, if we had known something earlier as individuals, but also as members of a community or indeed as citizens of a country. What if we, what if what we know now, if we had known it then, could go back and do things differently? So this demands that we reimagine the present really as only one of many possibilities, the one which happened to come true. But was there a moment in time when other roads forward seemed possible? And at, in the current moment, part of this is also a um, revisiting of past pandemics, um, past stories that we thought were long ago and far away and certainly had nothing to do with us, we all of a sudden realize are not quite as past as we might have thought. In fact, we come to learn, many of us, that the pandemics uh, have happened throughout the ages. You'll see here, I, I didn't even include uh, the Spanish flu, which is the one that people are talking about all the time now. Um, sharing is paused. No, I hope that's not paused. Um, anyway, uh, hold on a second. Am I getting a message from you? Sorry about this. I Hey Molly, we, we only see your first slide so far. I no. think, yes, I think you have to either, um, maybe you turn off the screen sharing uh, and turn it on again. Maybe that will help. Oh no. I'm so sorry about this. So I have, I can't believe that. Okay, so what did you say? Turn off screen sharing? Turn it off and turn it on again, I recommend. Okay. So I'm so sorry about that. All is good all my beautiful PowerPoint slides. Yeah, we want to see them all. Okay, that looks much better. Yes, that's it. That's what we want to see. So, but you have to show us the other slides first. Yeah, okay. So what I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to keep on these headphones because otherwise I can't, I'll, I'll just forget it. Okay, so, hmm, that was quite a start. Okay, so as I said, um, these, th these are the three aspects that are called into view, the dynamic nature of the temporal, the mediation between real and not real and, and the not yet real and the complexity of the construction of the other. And this was what I was just saying about the time traveling. And we're now in the first of these three, this revisiting the past. And as I say, there's been a sort of a revisiting of this of, in our knowledge of past pandemics and um, in fact, there's almost incessant uh, reporting on the Spanish flu of 1918, but indeed there's many others. And we know that pandemics bring with them great changes of all kinds and have done throughout our history. Well, what about our present lives? There's a rupture in our everyday lives, things that we had come to think were every day, just going to the office or, uh, being at a party or being in a social situation, going to protest, uh, going food shopping. Um, what was once every day is no longer every day. And we experience this as a crisis, not only of our society, but indeed many of us um, as a personal kind of crisis, an identity crisis. If we don't do those things, which we had thought really defined us, then who are we? And there's a sense of discontinuity where we are not living the imagined future that we thought we were moving towards. In fact, we are in a very, very different kind of future than we had ever really thought was possible for ourselves. So there is a, this is both in our private lives, but also in the cities that we live in and in the in the states and the countries in which we live. And we've seen, all of us have seen these incredible moving pictures of cities from the around the world, either cities that we've been in or hope one day to visit. And we see they are still, they are very still. And when they're not still right now, that makes us nervous. Are they not still enough? So a very different everyday life. 
and it even affects the Rolling Stones. Um, you can't always get what you want. I, I don't know if any of you um, saw that uh, the concert, which they their, their participation in the concert organized by Lady Gaga. But this was really a really moving moment, I thought, and and their choice of song was quite wonderful. So yes, the our experience of the current moment is our new every day is is very very altered. Well. In terms of the temporal, it also brings new hoped for and feared futures. So we ask ourselves, who am I in this new present in relation to who I'd like to be? Rebecca Solnit refers to finding another version of who we are, equipping ourselves for an unanticipated world. Well, we also have to look forward and think, well, who is the self that I will want to look back on? How will I want to feel that I acted in this pandemic, in this moment? Was I, was I the person that I would have liked to be? And we see in front of us both a world of new possibilities and of impossibilities. Um, for instance, when will any of us ever be in a scene like this again at a festival? or indeed at a protest or any kind of public gathering. On the other hand, we know that, that some of the changes are very good for the climate. Will we be able to sustain them? We don't know. The second axis that comes into view when looking at the relationship between narrative and imagination is this mediation between the real the not real and the not yet real. And I want to look at these in terms of the pandemic. So first, the real, what is the real? Well, today's news is that we actually, we have more than 5 million cases of the coronavirus, more than 300,000 deaths yesterday, I saw the biggest global daily increase. There's no vaccine. There's a shortage of testing, a shortage of PPE. There's skyrocketing unemployment in the United States. It's said that um, the unemployment is equal only to that of the time of the Great Depression. And indeed, the United States with 5% of the world's population has 33% of the cases of the virus, one of its citizens dying every 49 seconds. In fact, it's more than that now, but that was when I made that slide. I'm going to um, use the United States as uh, my primary example here, one, because it's a very dramatic case, but also because it is the country of my birth. The real also has other aspects to it. Uh, as Rebecca Solnit has commented, the impossible has already happened. We've seen an extending of workers' rights and benefits, the early release of prisoners, sheltering the homeless, Portugal has extended temporary citizenship for migrants and asylum seekers. So some things that we've always been told we could not do, in fact, we've already seen this crisis has produced. But obviously it's not all good news, not at all. People have described this moment as a gift for totalitarian governments. The pandemic has disrupted civil society compromised our ability to gather and advocate while the world sees increasing authoritarianism, xenophobia, rising rates of police brutality, domestic violence, and other social ills. I heard recently that Zimbabwe had passed a law that prohibited the gathering of more than two people in public spaces and uh, for those people who were seen to undermine the, eff the efforts of the government to contain the virus, they would be subject to 20 years of imprisonment. So it's quite a frightening time. And we see a, a quite dangerous uh, threatening to human rights around the world. And if you don't know this particular website, the Civic Freedom Tracker, it makes for very, very sobering reading. This is also the current moment, the current real. Well, what about the not real? We have 
in front of us um, a number of alternate realities as laid out by the President of the United States, Donald Trump. He alternately has described coronavirus as a hoax, a political conspiracy. He tells us it's contained, it's unique in history. It's no worse than the seasonal flu. He's told us for some time that we have sufficient PPE and tests for all. And indeed, he, a number of his followers also articulate those viewpoints. You can see from the image on the right there, this tweet from a young man who says, all the people who are placing themselves under self-quarantine are posers looking for cheap headlines. Stop being a baby, go to the gym. Obesity is the real pandemic. Okay, we see here also what John Mack has called a resistance to knowing. People fearing a truth so much that it is the implications of what is real are too much for them to take on. And so they act as if it is not real. This leads to a magical thinking, wishing the virus away. If we act as if it's not true, it will disappear. Well, we see a lot of this in the claims made by Donald Trump. And I'm going to just look at these uh, briefly. The first, January 22nd, he tells us, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China. We have it under control. So it's gonna be just fine. A month later, we're gonna be, we're going to be pretty soon at only five people. We could be at just one or two over the next short period of time. So we've had really good luck. The next day, it's gonna disappear one day. It's like a miracle, it will disappear. Yeah, that, that really would have been a miracle. I just think this is something that you can never really think is going to happen. It's an unforeseen problem. Well, what a problem came out of nowhere. He continued this line in other days, calling the virus that blind, it, saying uh, that it had blindsided the world. He also says, I would view it as something that just surprised the whole world. There's never been anything like this in history. There's never been, and nobody's ever seen anything like this. Well, that's not really true, actually. Let's look at some of the facts here. In 2018, Trump disbanded the National Security Council's pandemic response team. Ironically, he did so the day before they were acknowledging the 100th anniversary of the Spanish Civil War. Luciana Borio, the director for medical and biodefense preparedness said at the time, the threat of the pandemic flu is the number one health security concern. It is not a matter of if, but rather of when we will face it. From January to August of 2019, there was a simulation exercise by the Department of Health and Human Services, which was called Crimson Contagion. The report of the simulation exercise was delivered to the president in October. And this described the federal government as, quote, underfunded, underprepared, uncoordinated for a life or death battle with a virus for which no treatment existed. In the end of November, as Americans were celebrating Thanksgiving in our homes, the White House was made aware of the contagion in China's Wuhan region by the National Center for Medical Intelligence. He received a report based on wiring and computer intercepts coupled with satellite images. And analysts told the White House at the time that this could be a cataclysmic event. Between early January and February, the White House received a dozen intelligence briefings warning of the threat of a pandemic. And by February the 27th, the Senate Intelligence Committee was told that the virus is probably more akin to the 1918 pandemic. So really not such a surprise. But for Trump, these things really just aren't true. We see really quite dramatic examples of this magical thinking. So his own assessment is that 
the US response has been a quote, a great success story. When asked how would he rate the response, he said, I'd rate it at a 10. On May the 1st, we've done a great job. May the 5th, we're opening up our country again. And this is what we're doing. I'll tell you, the whole world is excited watching us because we're leading the world. Well, we are leading the world, but not in ways that other countries would like to emulate. On May the 6th, for those people that have lost somebody, nothing can ever happen that's going to replace that. But from an economic standpoint, purely an economic standpoint, I think next year is potentially going to be one of the best years we've ever had. There aren't a lot of other economists that have that viewpoint. But and then on May the 11th, he says, all throughout the country, the numbers are coming down rapidly. Well, Sadly, that's not true. At, at the very time he was making that proclamation, we were receiving the predictions of the forecast of deaths to come in the summer months. The numbers aren't coming down rapidly. And then for the not yet real, what could happen? This causes us to look at possible and probable futures. And this is both as individuals and as citizens of countries. Countries are seen in relation to each other when they had their first outbreak of the virus. Country X is two weeks behind Y, and from this we can do certain things unless particular actions are taken. So this has provided some countries who developed the virus later a look into the future to see what's coming around the bend. But as I say, different possible futures are constructed depending on actions which are taken or not taken. And for instance, in today's news, we see in the United Kingdom, the announcement that the UK is running out of time on track and trace. If we don't do this now, it will no longer be a possibility and the consequences will be dramatic, explosive. The third component then is the narrative imagination and reconstructing the other. Well, there's been a long-standing challenge for many in the Northern Hemisphere to see ourselves as the vulnerable other. Yes, we know that pandemics happen, but we have never really regarded them as our own. We had SARS, we have Ebola, but but that didn't really affect us. The, those were someone else's story, not ours. For many, they described the pandemic as unimaginable, but we know that there are whole populations for whom this is not unimaginable at all. In fact, they've had this drill before. So we are asked to actually reconnect with this idea of who are these other others. And in this group, we also identify ourselves, the other other who we once were before life changed. The pandemic has brought into view this, the global interconnectedness, which does not respect borders. We know that we are only as healthy as the sickest amongst us. And we also know that this challenge to reconstruct the other is not only a spatial challenge, but also in his, a historical one. As I already said earlier, we've regarded, we have come to regard this moment in history as one in which many of us thought that pandemics could never happen to us. But all of a sudden we see that we are these vulnerable others both making connections with earlier pandemics, but also sometimes failing to appreciate how different pandemics really are from each other. As Adam Kucharski has written in his book that's just come out, The Rules of Contagion, he says, if you've seen one pandemic, you've seen one pandemic. So to what extent do we actually recognize ourselves and others? And to what extent is this comparison also limited and problematic? We've heard a lot of people say that 
this pandemic has showed that we are all in this together, but we also know very well that we are not equally all in this together. The fact that Prince Charles and Boris Johnson had the virus notwithstanding. We know that the virus has disproportionately affected marginalized sectors of the population. And indeed that many people have experienced heartbreak like this in the past. As Chakrabarty writes in The Guardian about his mother fleeing East Bengal, he says, they were plunged close to poverty and then saw their family land in East Bengal disappear after partition. Even now, as our world is turned upside down, it's worth remembering that some among us have lived through far worse. So now the challenge before us is that of reimagining a new future. We are at a crossroads of change. The study of previous pandemics shows us that like it or not, change does come. The question is, what will that change look like? As Rebecca Solnit has written, one of our main tasks now is to understand this moment, what it might require of us, what it might make possible. There's no going back to normal. And nor should we say, do we want to go back to many aspects of the old normal? The future will not in crucial ways be anything like the past. So what is it that we want it to look like? The hope for the future depends, I think, upon a rethinking of our past. What is it that has led us to this current moment? I want to close with an extract uh, by Rebecca Solnit, where she says, this storm clears. When this storm clears, we may, as do people who have survived a serious illness or accident, see where we were and where we should go in a, a new light. We may feel free to pursue change in ways that seemed impossible while the ice of the status quo was locked up. We may have a profoundly different sense of ourselves, our communities, our systems of production, and our future. Well, I hope so, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Molly. Thank you so much for it. Very stimulating talk. Uh, I can. I would like to invite everyone to use the Q and A feature to post your questions. Uh, for the ones among you who've done that before, you know how to use it. If this is your first time uh, in a Zoom webinar, uh, if you go to the bottom of your screen, you'll get um, a menu bar where you have a little tool that says Q and A. You can simply open it up and post your questions in there and we will do our best to answer them here. Um, Molly, I take the privilege to ask the first question. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you for, for a stimulating talk. Um, I like the way in which uh, you quote Sartre here and bring in the real, the not real, the not yet real. I'm wondering if I look at what's going on right now, and I mean, how do we know what's going on right now? Because it's going on right now in many ways and the story is not told. Um, and um, this is maybe also what produces so much uncertainty as to how we continue. Yet at the same time, and uh, this has been part and partial of your talk, I think also there is already a story. We already have a story of a pandemic we kind of actually have it under control, weirdly. We don't, but yes, we do. We have this narrative of, okay, uh, this is how we're gonna organize um, the, the public realm now. Everyone stays at home. We wait for two weeks because we have somehow figured out two weeks is what we have to wait. And then we somehow uh, start um, public life again. We maybe wear a mask, maybe not. We don't really know whether this is what we should do, but still we do it and somehow it's gonna work out. In other words, what I'm trying to say is we have a kind of finished narrative that already includes 
that which is real, where we are right now, that which is not real, namely that we somehow compare uh, this with what has happened in the past and somehow assume that this is the same, namely that we somehow argue we're going to have a vaccine while no one knows whether we're actually going to have a vaccine, and this that which is not yet real, namely that we're going to teach, if we talk about our very private lives, that we're probably going to be teaching online in the fall, but then somehow at one point we somehow expect that everything will go back to normal. So I'm wondering, um, Essentially, how do we discern this kind of conundrum of the real, the not real, uh, in this overarching narrative that we all seem to have ready at hand? Well, uh, I, I think, I mean, I, I think that one of the things which is really interesting uh, is that probably the single worst response that we that could have happened at a policy level was the very one that was adopted by the two countries where I have passports, that's to say the United States and the UK, which was to say, let's kind of pretend it's not happening. Okay, we're just gonna go on with life. And, and uh, you know, Boris Johnson was uh, really focused on another reality that was to say the Brexit, which was um, happened on January the 31st when we left the EU. Um, and, and other matters, and, and Donald Trump, we already saw on those slides there. Now, what previous pandemics have showed is that the real way through it is through it, okay? That the very worst thing you can do is hide information from people. Yes, people will become scared, but actually there's a good reason why they might become scared, but you need to actually send out as much information as possible. And I would actually say that's one of the reasons why Hong Kong, for instance, has one of the most incredible responses to this. Hong Kong has actually ha had four deaths, four, okay? Despite having extraordinary traffic, direct traffic between them and Wuhan. And it was not the government of Carrie Lam who actually provided information. On the, on the contrary, she was very much involved in disinformation. It was in fact the citizens' rights movements on the ground, the pro-democracy movement, who utilized already existing networks of information to galvanize literally from the very first day a, in, a very, very sophisticated information uh, machine and a, um, an online uh, a website, but with many, many arms. And I think that there's a reason why they've only had four, four deaths, okay? Because, um, so I think despite that um, many of us are narrative people and we you know, tend to explore subjective realities and the fluidity of stories, et cetera, I think this is a case where Establishing what the facts are is really important. You can you can write your story. That's great, okay. And you come to some, but actually, the nuts and bolts information, even accepting that there are many uncertainties, as you rightly indicated, but taking the information that we do have and making that public is what's really important. I'm going to continue with a question that uh, Corin posted uh, that connects to what we just said. Uh, she asks, have you come across any narrative imaginings of a COVID or post-COVID future that are in a positive direction persuasive to you? Um, yeah, perhaps not as... Uh, um completely knitted together story, but um, in fact, I, recently I gave a, a paper on um, political activism in COVID-19 times. And uh, this was, we had some really, really interesting discussion there where people were, uh, I mean, at the moment I am not living in, in Britain, I'm living uh, in Finland and people in Britain, for instance, were telling me, despite the really, uh, horrific response of the British government, that in fact, the organizing on the ground at local level, um, which you could say was perhaps just social activism, but in fact, it was imbued with a political consciousness and that the level and degree of organizing, many people 
have said and were saying in that talk earlier in the week, that they would be really surprised if all of a sudden those bonds were broken. Um, I think that um, we've seen a lot of uh, repurposing, if you will, of political movements, uh, a, a huge surge in trade unionism in the United States uh, because of the horrific way that workers have been treated, but also these questions. I mean, there are not very many people now who question whether or not it's good for everyone that there is access to public health, uh, that people should be allowed to take vacation days when they are sick, um, you know, that, that prisoners, uh, that there are many people serving time inside who should not be, all that kind of stuff. So I think that, um, that there are seeds, let me put it that way. I'm going to maybe press the issue a little bit further with what Brian just posted. He, he says, I'm wondering, and maybe I'm wondering the same, I'm wondering if Molly can comment a little more on what's real in this context, because I think that's maybe one of the important arguments to make here. What, what is the real when we talk about narrative imagination and the facts? Well, I mean, I, I tried to, I mean, <laughs> there are so many aspects of the real. Okay, uh, and I tried, and, and those slides were kind of hard to put because at one level, I just wanted to put out there, you know, no, this isn't a hoax. No, it's not like the flu. No, it's not, you know, it doesn't, it's not gonna be a miracle and go away. Okay, there are these things, there are these cases, etc. cetera. Um, but I think equally important is the other is the is the next two slides that I had after that. One was these, uh, uh, let's say, spontaneous local uh, political social organization that is happening, but also the the very very worrying cut back on human rights that we see around around the world. I mean, actually, you know, some people in the United States are saying, well, what's going to happen with the November election? I mean. Okay, how is that? Are we going to have an election? I mean, we know Orban has now canceled their elections, what, indefinitely. So, I mean, these are also real things. The real is not just related to the virus. The real is also very much about how it is dealt with and how that moment is used. Um, and I think that's extremely important. Um, I'm trying to work with the questions tool here. Just want to remind everyone that you can upvote questions by others if uh, you want me to um, prioritize them, and then I'm happy to do so. One of the questions that has been uh, upvoted very much to the top is um, to say, first of all, thank you for a powerful talk. And then uh, Carmen is asking, I would like to hear your thoughts about how narrative relates to uncertainty. It doesn't seem to me that Trump is mainly unable to let in knowledge, but to show a tolerance for ambiguity. Mm. I don't think, I'm not sure how ambiguous it is. Um, I think that, um, I think, I think that there's a kind of different story going on there if you will, if you want to use a narrative term, I think that um, it's not coincidence that he is um, targeting states which have democratic uh, governors and he is encouraging them to open up, right? I mean, and, and um, I mean, I don't think that's ambivalent. I think that's really strategic. Um, and I think that, I think that narrative can contribute some, but not everything in this moment. Okay, and I think that one of our challenges is really at the very end where I was trying to say, well, what is the future, both that we hope will happen, but also that we're really frightened will happen? And how do we actually try to minimize one and build the other? And this is not just a narrative question. Okay, there's a really small window of opportunity where profound global change is going to happen. And to see it's not going to happen, it's already happening. And I think that we need to actually not just um, what, uh, you know, cultivate our own gardens right now. To be honest, I think that's, that's not something we should be doing. I think we need to be highly alert 
of what is already happening and the dangers that are, we are facing, as well as the possibilities. And um, so I think it's not really just a question of narrative. I think it's a question of coming of how you actually politically resist things, even while we cannot physically be together and congregate. I want to continue with a question Mark post, posted here, which connects exactly to what you just said. He says he is sympathetic with uh, Solnitz and also your vision, your hope for the future. But he also says that he is fearful. Uh, what sometimes happens in the face of intense anxiety and uncertainty and vulnerability is an effort to regain, to reassert strength and power possibly leading us further in the direction of a violent authoritarian future. So his question is, and that's also mine, and maybe it's a question uh, for, for many, many, many of us, and maybe that's also a question where narrative imagination uh, comes in big time. What gives you, what gives us, what can give us hope? What gives you hope in this scenario? Hmm. Well, I mean, I think in, in some ways I, I, I... I alluded to it uh, um, already. I mean, I do think that, you know, uh, we have seen some, some favorable changes for sure. You know, we have seen, um, I mean, many people report just at the most, a, a new every day is, is how much bird song there is, okay? A new every day is that, you know, for those of us who live under flight paths, we don't actually hear the planes every day, okay? Um, I had my first experience of, of even going on public transportation the other day, my first in months, and I thought, okay, I'm actually gonna wait a few more months. It was not fun. Uh, these days, these last few months, every single place we go, we, we walk or we cycle, right? I mean, it's just what you do. And so these are, um, these are things of necessity, but they're also quite favorable in some ways. Um, I do think that it's not just the worry of uh, violent authoritarianism. I also think there is, um, I'm gonna sound pretty cynical here, but um, I think I already mentioned, it. there's an inclination amongst some to actually experience this as a, just as a personal challenge, okay? And the whole thing, I actually was um, part of a, a Zoom uh, meeting where the actor Dominic West uh, was describing his idyllic life. I think it's in the Berkshires or something. And he said it was, um, he, he described it as absolute utopia, okay? And how beautiful it is. And his wife is a gardener and his kids are all in the gardening project now. And they love, you know, that's great. Okay, it's fine for some, good. Not everybody has that. And I think that one of the problems is to forget that we are really not all in this together. Some people are suffering terribly. And there is this window of opportunity where governments are taking the limited powers that their citizens were already allocated. So I think that to call this moment one of utopia is also really, really problematic. And if the only thing we're doing is tending to our own limited experiences within our homes, within our gardens, even on our streets, that's a problem. And so to go back to what Mark was saying, um, I think we need to actually make sure that even while we cannot be physically together, that we use the tools which are available to us to make sure that, um, that the changes are as positive as they can be and to minimize the negative, yeah. Thank you, I want to connect this to another question. Uh, Shilot, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, uh, posted here. Um, yes, stay positive and uh, find ways in which we continue despite what is happening uh, and uh, use a narrative imagination to hopefully create a positive future together. Yet at the same time, and uh, you, alluded to that in your talk as well, we're also reinventing our past. Maybe mm. we quickly, more quickly than we can realize. We see like, for example, if we turn on movies right now and we see people in Manhattan walking down the street and it's packed and we think like, 
how can they do that for a moment until we realize, yes, actually, of course, that was before Corona and we could behave like that. How in France people say hello to each other in a very different way than they used to. And they might not, Brian alluded to this yesterday in his talk, and they might not return uh, uh, to the original way. And it becomes a new normal so quickly to yeah. us. And this new normal then, of course, is in many ways also the basis of the imagination for our future. So uh, I, I think I would want to ask, um, how can we avoid this or how can we make sure that this new normal does not necessarily become a normal that quickly but that we continue to question the kinds of changes that we go through in order to keep an open mind and be able to imagine a not not a continuation of what we had in the past but a new future after yeah. this yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that this is a challenge uh, for, for all of us, actually. It's as individuals, as members of families and members of households, as colleagues. Um, you know, there's, I, I, I think it's, it is a, it will be an ongoing challenge in front of us. Okay. And I think, but the other thing I want to say is because the term narrative imagination and the word imagination more generally, um, has often been used to indicate the more positive things that, that we muster in our minds. But in fact, I would like to also say that equally important are our feared nightmares, okay? And I think um, going forward, I mean, to me, it, we, have to both, we have to balance both what we, what we hope to be, what, 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 what parts even of our new existence that we want to bring forward with us. Um, but equally, we have to remember how it was that we have arrived at the moment where we are now. And this is a much more of a nightmarish vision. And some people, um, you know, for me, for instance, just speaking on a personal level, I mean, I, I live my life very much across several continents. And that is how I physically hold my family close to me, physically, right? Will I still be doing that? You know, um, you know what? Uh, how how often? When when? What kinds of trips will those be? I'm not just talking about saying I want to see other countries. I'm saying uh, I want to see my father, right? You know, I mean. So these are questions which uh, which we need to think about as we go forward, and um, and what we were doing before is not going to be something that we can keep doing in the same way. So. Thank you. Um, Gordana is asking, uh, as so-called past normality has become so desirable, this would mean that the post-corona future would be just repetition or even strengthening of all those processes which substantially contributed to our current crisis. So in many ways, um, exactly what you just said, living uh, across various continents and Many of us academics do the same thing. We fly uh, because it's our job, but we also fly because our families are spread out. And um, in many ways, uh, we're not, maybe not personally responsible for carrying the coronavirus from one continent to the other, but it's our lifestyle that contributes to that. So um, is, the, is there the way, I mean, how do we imagine continuing our lives um, once we have maybe this particular coronavirus under control, but potentially face the next one coming up. Do we have to reinvent all this? Do we have to reinvent family life? Is Zoom, is this two dimensional a way of interacting with people the new future? Where do we go? I mean, the, <laughs> the, the challenge is huge, okay? And, and I was reading um, something recently and I think it's right that says, look, this coronavirus is just dress rehearsal for what's gonna happen with climate change, okay? And once we actually get the vaccine, if we get the vaccine, we will have at least some kind of a remission, okay? But that will not happen actually with climate change, okay? Um, and for whatever dramatic changes we are being 
we are experiencing now, we actually think, well, they will, we will go back to this other thing. But that will not always be the case. And maybe this is the moment that many people are starting to think more seriously about that. And actually, um, as the, the quote I used from Rebecca Solnit earlier, where she said the impossible is already happening, we've been told that we can't do without all of these different things. And yet we see that we can. Now, I don't want to make it sound all too positive. I'm, I'm one that, you know, as nice as it is, you know, seeing you across here. I mean, the fact is I'm sitting by myself in a room and probably you are the same and many of us here are doing the same. I actually, and, and, and I mean, I, I hate online teaching. I find it really difficult. I want to see the bodies and the, and, and the, uh, the whole thing is just, and the idea that many people, you know, are going for months without ever touching another human being. I mean, I don't want to say there's not everything that I want, that, you know, for this to go forward. No, I don't want to be too rosy about this moment. But there are aspects um, which, which are favorable and which we can think about. Yeah. I want to switch maybe to uh, another aspect of your talk. Uh, you talked a lot about Trump, about politics, political narratives, uh, um, facts versus fiction that uh, Trump um, delivers. And Casey is, is asking here, first of all, she says, thank you for a wonderful talk, uh, but aren't you being too generous with Trump? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I've never been accused of that. <laughs> it, it isn't so magical. Imag imaging things are mag magically connected and your wishes are coming true in the parentheses, but rather a calculating uh, upspeak designed to talk to, mar to the markets up. He is speaking quite rationally, so the argument goes, to a particular audience. Don't we need to analyze Trump's actions as rational rather than magical? It's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I would go along with that, sure. I mean, I just like this idea of magical thinking as well, but I think that, um, uh, I know, I, I, I would go along with that as well. I think that, you know, Piaget always had, you know, from what point of view is the wrong answer right? That's what sort of motivated his research. And I think that that's our, our question here with Trump. From what point of view is his, does his response make sense? And it's, I, uh, it's, it, there is a very strong inner logic in that. And even when he's inconsistent, there's a strong inner logic there. So I, I really do agree with that. And actually that one quote, which I read, um, where he says, oh gosh, you know, those of you who've lost family members, I mean, nothing's going to, that actual quote, if um, I, I only put part of it, but it's, it's quite extended and it's so chilling because he literally is putting, he's balancing one. Yeah. It's such a shame and it's so bad. And so, but by the way, the upside is, and you're just like, have you actually put those two things together? Literally, you know, right together. It was just chilling watching him. So um, anyway, so I, yeah, I, I agree with that, Casey. I definitely do. Well, it would be an interesting question to, to uh, analyze that further, to what extent what he does is actually rational and to what extent he's just on the stage and uh, doing things on the spot. Dan McAdams is probably still sleeping. If he was in the audience, we could bring him in and ask him since he... Uh, put some research into that. Uh, we have another question that goes into the same uh, direction, maybe. It says, to what extent uh, these po policies you are talking about in the UK and in the USA uh, came out of, a wilf out of willful negligence, lack of political care of the masses, or simple pure ignorance of the potential lethal power of uh, COVID-19? I think that... Um... Oh wait, could you just repeat the very first part of that question? Because I, 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 my mind was already going someplace with this. So just the very yeah. first part. Just to what extent these policies you're talking about uh, come out of willful negligence, lack of political care of the masses, or simply pure ignorance of 
the potential uh, lethal power. Okay, I think I think one of the most interesting things that's happened again, just to use the United States, but there are other examples. But that one, I, I really have been spending quite a lot of time with. Um, you actually see that the virus is just showing up the already existing very, very deep cracks in the system, okay? And uh, the, the fact that it is so disproportionately affecting different sectors of the population, that isn't to do with the virus. That's actually to do with fundamental inequality that is rife throughout the United States. That's what that's about. So I don't think, I, I think that it is, showing us stuff that we haven't wanted to be looking at for a long time. Now, the same is true. My guess is that it's the same is true in, in many other countries as well. I also think that in the country where I'm living right now, Finland, it also shows that the, the basic, the fundamental values are of social welfare, okay? And the way that it is approached is just fundamentally different. Um, and it's the same virus, but it is dealt with in a very, very different way. So I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I think that it is exposing already existing conditions, so. Um, I, we have another question in the audience here that, that connects, again, that again connects to that and also connects a little bit to our uh, previous uh, keynote speaker, uh, Luca Tateo, who um, emphasized the fact that uh, we're using war rhetoric when we talk about the virus. Uh, so uh, the question here reads, thank you for the inspiring talk, Molly. Is it possible there is a narrative of exaggeration uh, out of panic and lack of time of reflection about the current situation? In other words, are we, that's how I read it, uh, are we exaggerating uh, what is happening right now? Should we calm it down further and uh, have a more nuanced way of, of looking at the current crisis? Okay, um, first to go to the first part of your comment, which is about the war language. I mean, this is actually an extremely interesting thing itself. Um, the idea, uh, and if we can connect that, I think to questions of the other, who is the other? What is the other? What's the enemy, okay? And this war language seems particularly inappropriate when what is needed is a highly developed collaboration. Um, I saw a Facebook post which said something like um, uh, opening up some states but not others is like saying that you're going to have a section of the swimming pool where people can pee, okay? I think that the idea that we actually have to work together towards something, that we have to, de to develop a collaborative vision is really, really important. The, the exaggeration of our panic um, is an interesting one. The, the lack of time for reflection about the current situation. I don't know. I think there is a lot of reflection going on. One of the things I would say that's very um, uh, I, my, I myself, but I think many others as well, have spent a lot of time not only reading, there been some, there's been some really outstanding, outstanding coverage in the media, as well as uh, alarmist stuff. But I mean, some of the deep coverage has just been exceptional. And, um, and some, you know, The Atlantic, for instance, is just putting out one fabulous piece after another. But in addition to that, people are also returning to classics, you know, um, and there's a lot of, for instance, you know, poetry uh, circulars, which are going on a lot now. And I think that there is a sort of movement towards a um, taking this moment and reflecting. We, we've been, you know, even you read in the, in the daily newspaper, um, about Seneca, right, and the old philosophers and about the importance of contemplation and interweaving it uh, with action in our lives. I, so I, I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I think that there already is that. And I think that um, even, even in some of the most hot spots, places like New York City, where one of my brothers lives, um, actually the stories that I have heard from, yeah, yeah from the groundswell up, as it were, New York City, where 
where people are literally starving. There's not enough food, right? And yet the conversation that my brother has been telling me between himself and other workers who are going about doing food distribution there is incredible. It's also very moving. Um, so I think that, that even in situations which, which could be panic stricken, we've seen both the best and the worst in people. Um, we have here both a comment and a question from uh, Michelle Ferrari. Uh, I'm wondering, Michelle, do you want to come on and ask the question yourself? Then I could just bring you on here. If you give me a sign in the chat, then I will do that. Um, and while you think about it, I'll pick another question quickly from Molly, and otherwise I'll read it out. Um, uh, Lee Jun says, I appreciate, Molly, uh, we're not using the record. Oh, we're not recording the using the recorded video, which is better experience to me. Okay, maybe that's, uh, I maybe missed uh, the question that I wanted to read, sorry. Barbara says, thanks Molly for an interesting discussion on rethinking the past in the present or in, in the future. Different viewpoints on timing for learning lessons. Uh, is leaving it till it's over or is it too late? If you scroll down, maybe you can have a look at the question yourself. Um yeah, I, okay. Oh, I see there's so much here. I really, I hope we'll, I'll get to see these um, later as well. I think that that's a really, really important point, okay? Because that, that quote, which I close with, um, Rebecca Solnit, where she says, when the storm has cleared. But yeah, I would say we can't actually wait for the storm to clear, okay? This storm's going to be around for a long time. And as we said, this, even when this one goes away, there's going to be another. So I like the metaphor but actually it's rather limited. This moment uh, of opportunity that we have in which to act um, is, it is limited. And so, yeah, I think that, um, that that is a really important question. But I think, I think no, I think the moment is now, I, and that's what, one of the things I've been trying to emphasize there as well. Um, and again, to, to say to people, to look at that human rights tracker as well, if you wonder the kinds of actions that are going on every single day now in terms of the retraction of human rights around the world. It's really sobering. Uh, I haven't heard from Michelle so far, so I'm going to read it out, the comment and also the question. Um, it reads, in the USA, it seems as if social media leads to a rupturing of the national imagination imaging of the story about what is real, not real, and impossible. The battle for President Trump seems to be to convince enough voters of his imagined fantasy long <laughs> enough to be reelected. So the question is, oh, and there it jumps. The question is, what can be done to help generate a united and proactive story to help galvanize people, as in Hong Kong, or does the Hong Kong example show the end to build islands of truth and shore up those? I think the thing that we have to learn from Hong Kong, although I was told by my daughter that actually even uh, th that my information about Hong Kong, even though I had gotten it a few days ago, is already out of date. And that, in fact, um, these very activists who I've been citing in recently um, are... Uh, facing being arrested. Uh, actually, um, uh, yeah, so quite horrific stories. But let's just, uh, when I was putting this together, that, that had not happened. Um, and uh, so I think the case of Hong Kong, what is most um, important about them is this information campaign. And that, um, and I've seen this also in other countries where people, uh, where the point is that you can't actually always look to the government. In fact, sometimes not at all look to the government. In the United Kingdom, I think the, the British people have been so much better than our leadership. We have proven ourselves to be so much more worthy than the prime minister himself. To see him clapping at 8 p.m. on Thursday nights for the NHS he of all people, I mean, it's pretty outrageous. And yet, you know, you see these examples when they are calling for volunteers and they want 250,000 and they get 750,000. I think that, the, um, that there are many, many hopeful things that 
happen, which are which show that people that organized people can be much better than their governments. That's certainly the hate case in Hong Kong. You've also seen that across the United States where you have these, um, for instance, with food shortages, you actually see it's people on the ground, people, communities who are organizing to get the food out of the warehouses, onto the trucks, distributed. That's not the president. He's not going to do that. And um, so I think that there's different levels of that question. Helen is uh, confronting us maybe with a little bit of, of pessimism, and I want to hear your thoughts about that. She says, I do agree that there have been some positive changes and some shifts in narrative which open possibilities, but I'm very worried that there are powerful other narratives which either diminish the credibility of real facts or provide convincing narratives that make Trump's perspective acceptable, like freedom, the economy comes first because our future depends on this. Most people who died were already vulnerable. These are, she says, the narratives which persuade people to open up again. I'd like to hear your comments about I, that. I know, I agree. I think that is a fear. I think that is uh, correct. What I also think, though, is that if we resist this um, temptation, as nice as it is, to, uh, let's say, attend to our own gardens, if we actually collectively and in our homes, collectively alone, um, try to inform ourselves and do information campaigns, that that's where the hope does lie. But I absolutely agree. I don't think that that um, and that's why I was saying the narrative imagination, it doesn't have to be, it, it's not necessarily a positive thing. It can be a, a complete nightmare. And I think that the president's view of the future is for me exactly that, is a nightmare. So yeah, I, I, I think that's correct. Michael adds here, he says, thanks, Molly. Could you comment on what you, we as psychologists can contribute in all this? And is there a way to reimagine the discipline of psychology? I think this is a beautiful question because it's also at the core of this con conference, right? Mm, yes. It's very nice to think of Michael after. Um, hi, Michael. <laughs> Um, what do I think? Yeah, I think that we as psychologists actually need to move away from this whole question of individual psychological health and that we need to realize um, how important community health is. And um, I think that it's, there's been some really interesting things which I think have happened over the last few months. Um, I don't know of any research on this, but I have heard anecdotally that it's that many people who suffer from manic depression have actually found this moment to be in some ways easier to deal with than other people because for the first time other people are beginning to experience that kind of alienation uh, and rupture that in fact has been more part of their lives. I think that's really, I've, I've heard that um, from several people also telling me about their own experiences. I think we have a lot to learn from that. Um, and again, because we tend as, a, as parts of society to other people who experience, who have mental health problems, and we don't actually take that as a community problem. And now I think that we have to realize that it really is a community problem as well. And um, Michael knows me well enough to know that I'm always interested in this question of political narratives and political psychology. And I think that the response really is not just in the individual mind and heart and home. I think um, that we, if we are to come out of this, we will come out together and we need to make that so. Kuril has two questions here, and I think the first one connects beautifully to what we just said. Um, uh, we read here, you said during your presentation that governments failed in delivering an appropriate narrative in times of crisis. Knowing that the pandemic, uh, knowing that the pandemic we're experiencing today have been uh, seen before. 
in your opinion, what could be considered a successful narrative? Um, okay. I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm I got not a little bit lost sure there, but I, I, I think I, I read the question. The way in which I read the question, and if I'm wrong, then please correct me uh, with, with another question that you can post. But the way in which I read the question here is to say, so um, if um, we haven't found a narrative that steers us through this crisis, what would be a positive narrative that we could have uh, in order to maybe stay on top of what is happening or maybe to... Um, um, open the gates for narrative imagination for a positive future. Okay, I'm going to, um, I'm going to resist your interpretation there for a second, okay. because I've just reread this question. And it okay. says, knowing that the pandemic we're experiencing today has never been seen before. But I think that's the very thing that is the thing we need to question, okay? That is what Trump is telling us. It came out of the blue. Nobody's ever experienced anything like this, da, 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 da. And I'm saying, I think there's a lot of evidence that that just isn't true. Maybe some of us, I mean, I've never experienced something like this, okay? But there are many people, perhaps some of the people you've been watching this right now, but there are many people living in other parts of the world who have experienced pandemics. And in fact, you know, as I said, they, they actually, um, that's one of the things I also said about Hong Kong is that they actually knew how to respond better because they've been through this before. Um, and, you know, there are, so I think that the idea for me that, that we have never experienced this before, some of us have never experienced this before. And when we tell ourselves, I mean, in, there's so many interesting parallels, not to overdo them, but, you know, for instance, with the Spanish flu of 1918, the idea that it was even called the Spanish flu, by the way, it didn't start, it wasn't Spanish, it started in the United States. Why is it called the Spanish flu? Ah, that might be because the United States didn't want to talk about it, even while we were busy exporting it at the end of World War I all over the place, okay? And there, it's, it's, it's really, I think the, the problematic construction there is that, is that this is unique in history. I think what perhaps is unique is this, okay? That when this has happened before and it has gone throughout the world, we have not been able to communicate with each other simultaneously about it, okay? Um, that is actually interesting. And that also might connect to what Michael was asking earlier about the role for psychologists, because we do have the opportunity, you and me and Michael sitting as we are in different countries at this exact moment, all together, okay? We have the moment to reflect on this, not only professionally, but also just as engaged citizens. And that's, that's something different. But I don't think that this really is as uh, unique a moment as we are always being told by the government that it is. It certainly didn't come out of the blue. I mean, I tried to keep that slide as short as I could, but the more I read, the more my blood just boiled. It certainly did not come out of the blue. We had every warning we needed. We just didn't heed them. We have had an intense discussion, even though it's just the two of us, but people are uh, sending in their questions. And of course, there, there are many, many out there and I'll try to represent all of you as good as possible. Unfortunately, we're uh, slowly running out of our time here. Um, still, we have Slack going on and you can uh, go and register if you haven't done so. And maybe one of the people in the background can do me the favor and post the link in the chat so that everyone can get registered. And Molly, if you are not registered yet, I will tell you after the talk how you can get there if you want to. Yeah. I, I want to. I want to. I want to ask one final question though before we close. And uh, it's a short one by Anetta, and I think it's still an important one about the category of normality. Um, normality is something that we maybe don't talk about if we believe that we're in it, uh, but which we instantly seem to either miss or imagine the moment we realize that it's maybe not there. That we have this category of this past normality that we were in uh, with us and now we are in a state where nothing is normal and maybe carry a hope of everything turning back to normal or a new normal or at the same time people might threaten us with the idea of this is the new normal, this is the new conference style forever. I don't know. So my question would be for you, how do we deal with this category of the normal, normality? Do we have to reinvent that category? 
Well, I think, again, I keep going back to Michael's question about psychologists. I think there's a lot of us, not just psychologists, but a lot of psychologists have actually been talking about everyday lives for a long time, actually. And I think that there is a lot to be said about, I mean, everyday lives do change, okay? And I mean, there are certain aspects which, which remain constant, but they change, okay? And they change for better and for worse. And we might grieve when we lose parts of them or we might celebrate. And there sometimes these changes are marked by ritual and a, and a big moment, but most often they are marked by smaller changes. So I think that, um, again, there's a sort of myth that, you know, that, that there has been a constant normal uh, and, that, and that all of a sudden that, that changes. But clearly um, there are some aspects like not going to work or, or being outside, which, which have changed. And I think that it's a mixed bag. You know, um, there are many people who do actually say, well, I'm spending more time with my kids. Uh, fathers are spending more time with their children at home. Uh, at the same time, there's more domestic violence and uh, deaths in, in the home. Um, it's a complicated picture. Um, and I think that there, that is really why it, there, it is a moment for the Stoics, okay? We do need to sit back and actually take the temperature of where we currently are. What, what aspects of this new normal do we celebrate? What would we like to take forward? Um, how do we combine critically with the Stoics the idea of combine, combining contemplation with action? So how does this get woven and interwoven again into our lives going forward. And I hope that um, this crisis, uh, that we don't come out of this crisis evading that possibility for rethinking what kind of future we want as individuals, but also as communities. And this is maybe also where we as psychologists and uh, social researchers find our task to strengthen that hope. Absolutely, absolutely. Molly, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and a wonderful discussion. As I said before, we'll continue on Slack throughout the conference. And I hope to see you uh, in other talks as well. Thank you. Thank so you. Much. So do we just leave now? Is that what happens? We're leaving now, unfortunately. This is okay. unfortunately what happens. We're not going out for dinner this time, but next time we will. <laughs> okay, that's great. And do we get another. to thank you so much, everyone? Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.